So as you can see, the pull start on this outboard's locked pretty solid. So that's what this one's in here for today. I actually a bilge pump. As you can probably tell, it's another boat that lives on the water all the time, so it needs a bilge pump, particularly on uh, rainy days like this. Um, so I'm just going to start by whipping the cowling off, and we'll have a look. Now, although this particular problem is a uh, is a stuck pull start, I'm uh, hoping a lot of what we see today will help you if you're also having a pull start that's coming out and not uh, recoiling back in. So we'll see how we go. We'll pull the whole thing apart and show you how it works anyway. Before we do that, all that background grinding just reminded me what arrived in the post. Which is very exciting. Road lapel bike. So from now on, hopefully, no bad audio, no background noise. It's taken a while to get that, um, but uh, I actually bought that using money from the channel. So it's kind of uh, nice to see that, you know, a bit of advertising or whatever. I know it's a bit annoying sometimes if it's not something interested in, but um, it does bring a little bit of money in that can uh, help buy things like microphones or whatever and hopefully make the videos better. So, uh, and also thank you to people. I know people have made a few sort of direct donations. Um, I don't get to see who that is, so I can't thank you personally, but you know who you are, so thank you. So this is a uh, Yamaha 15, but all the um, pull start mechanisms of the outboards are pretty similar. There isn't a huge difference between the brands. Now this unit's held on by uh, three 10 mil fasteners. They come off as a unit, so they're, you know, springs and things don't fly everywhere. Don't be afraid about taking it off. The only thing other than these bolts that attaches it to the outboard is this cable you can see. Uh, it comes up here and runs around to the top. And this is the starting gear protection. This is what will only let you pull the cord if it's in neutral. So if it's in gear, it will be locked. So there's a small chance that this is a, a, an issue with this starting gear protection. So even though it's in neutral, it's stopping it starting. But it feels pretty seized, to be honest with you. Normally, because this um, beds into the teeth will see, you'll normally feel a small amount of rocking if it's the starting gear. So we'll take these fasteners off and we'll see what we see. So once it's off, you'll see it's all quite self-contained, so it'll stay together, there's no dramas there. Um, then here you'll see there's some adjustment, so you can move these two locking nuts up and down this thread to adjust exactly where it sits. And down in here, there's a um, just a little sort of end piece to the uh, cable that slots into a groove. So if we back this off to give us a bit of slack, we'll be able to slide that out from there. Now I only need to back this top nut off, even though the whole cable's spinning. There we go. So I can slot it out, and then once it's out. Hopefully you can see this. I'll just grab some pliers. So once it's out from there, this part just slides out. And the whole thing's free. So now we can take this over to the bench and start pulling it apart and see what's going on. Having just put the uh, uh, recall mechanism down, I've just come over and had a feel of this flywheel and it's completely seized. So unfortunately, Without even touching that other unit, we know why it's not pull starting. It's actually not the recall unit at all, it's this. So I might have to rename this video, How to Unseize a Seized Motor. Uh, let me have a think about that. That happens very slowly, particularly without coffee. We'll get a coffee and then we'll have to think about it. Whatever you do, never try to fix a boat without coffee. Unless it's the afternoon, then never try and fix a boat without a beer. Oh, in case you ever wonder what's upstairs. This is where boring stuff like paperwork happens. And down there's the workshop. All right, enough nonsense. Let's get on with this. New step one, now we know what's going on with this motor, is uh, take these rusty looking spark plugs out. Um, now this motor um, lives on the water and doesn't get used a lot which is a, oops, sorry about that, shaking you around, uh, is a bit of a prime candidate for um, seizing problems. So what I'm going to do is uh, 
put something down here to lubricate this, the pistons here, because it's probably the rings a bit stuck, and we don't want to um, don't want to snap those rings. Uh, there's a few different things you can put in here. Uh, I think in the other Saving a Sunk video outboard, I used a bit of um, automatic transmission fluid, which is very fine and quite good for sort of uh, soaking in with a bit of capillary action. Um, I've also recently got some uh, sort of bolt buster stuff for unsticking seized bolts, um, which I'm almost tempted to try in this environment. So I'll give it a go and we'll see what happens. So this is what I'm going to try. Super releasing agent. Unseizes rusty components. Sounds good. Um, doesn't say you shouldn't spray it in someone's uh, cylinder bores. Alright, so I'm going to let that soak. It says 30 seconds, but I'll let it sit for a bit longer. Got other stuff to get on with anyway. So we'll let that sit, and then I'll just start rocking the flywheel backwards and forwards and seeing if we get any movement out of it. So I've got this trimmed all the way up now to try and get the surface of the pistons as level as possible. Uh, a bit more spray. And then I'm just going to fill these up with ATF until they overflow and then leave it overnight. sit tonight and we'll have a look in the morning. It's the end of the day now. This has been sitting all day. I was going to leave it overnight but I thought there's a bit of time now while things are quiet to have a look at this again. Um, so we filled it up with uh, ATF and it's sat there sort of uh, tilted up as much as I could for most of the day. So hopefully even this uh, higher end of the uh, cylinder boards have had um, oil against the rings. So now I've got a 22 mil socket that I'm going to pop on the flywheel and I'll just put a breaker bar here and we'll see if we can rock it a little bit. Um, so your average breaker bar is pretty long um, which means you can generate quite a bit of force, put a lot of torque on the socket. Um, the sort of golden rule is do no harm. Um, I'm just looking to do this relatively gently um, just to see whether it moves at all. It's moving a little bit but I'm not going to really um, force it. There's no doubt with a breaker bar this long you could just put your back into it and get this engine to move. But there's a good chance you'd end up damaging the rings inside it if you did. So we're looking to just see if it's moving at all, which it was then a little bit. Um, and then maybe even let it sit a bit longer because once it's moved, obviously it's reaching a, um, a different part of the bore. Um, maybe with a bit less corrosion, a bit more chance for the oil to come in. So I guess what I'm trying to say is Sure and steady wins the race with this. It is a little bit of a patience game. Um, now, normally motors only like to rotate in the direction they go. The biggest problem there is uh, four strokes going backwards. The um, camshafts, the way they wear, they don't really like to go backwards. Not such an issue with the two strokes. So I am happy to sort of rock this backwards and forwards a little bit uh, because we don't have those valves and cams, etc. Um, the only trouble here, of course, is that uh, you don't really get any traction until you've flopped the motor over to the other side of it. Steering without going to the effort of locking it off. So we'll try and move this back a little bit. Yeah, it is moving. You know, it's actually even more seized than I was hoping, but I would say not irrecoverably. So, what I'm going to do is just keep rocking this backwards and forwards. I won't bore you with that too much, uh, and we'll see how far we get. Um, probably end up just topping up the uh, transmission fluid and letting it sit overnight. But we'll see how far we get before the uh, four weeks time to go home. Show you over here. There's a fair shank of the ATF that's now uh, 
probably come out the exhaust ports in the side of the cylinder. That's fine. It served its purpose, so I'll clean that up. Uh, now, this boat, uh, you know, it's not like it sunk recently. It has sunk in its past history, but it has been running since there. So I'm not really worried about um, going through the full process we would in the saving a sunk output video. Um, I will just quickly have a look what's going on in the cover of the bowl. Um, just to make sure there's no water in there. Can't see why there would be. Um, and then uh, we might try and start this. All right, so this outboard that came in for a uh, stuck recoil actually has a fuel tank full of water. And obviously it's that water that's got into the cylinders and uh, seized them, corroded them. So we're gonna have to drain the fuel system a bit like the sunk outboard video uh, before we even think about starting this. I'm gonna go ahead now and um, take the carburetor off, clean the, um, clean the jets, you know, clean the bowl, clean the fuel pump, all that kind of stuff, uh, and get this going again. So uh, I'm not gonna show all those things again. I've shown them in other videos, um, the saving a sunk outboard and cleaning a carburetor video. Uh, but I'll just go ahead and do that, and hopefully we'll wrap this video up with just having this motor running. Uh, so in case you're wondering, um, this was just a thing of metho. Um, whenever I've got a carburetor that's water contaminated rather than gummed up with like fuel varnish, I use metho because alcohol is both uh, water and oil soluble. Morning, uh, day two now. Uh, last night I went to put the carburetor on and it um, had a seized throttle plate as well. So to get that going again, I just put a little bit of uh, CRC WD40 type stuff in there and that's nice and smooth again now so I'll put that on but what I'm going to do first is this has cylinders um, full of uh, automatic transmission fluid and a uh, crankcase probably full of automatic transmission fluid um, so I'm going to put the recall unit back on and pull it over a few times with the plugs out and just see how much we can get get that out how much of that we can get out um, Obviously, ATF's not designed to be burnt, which is a good reason to use um, two-stroke oil when you do this. Um, I just didn't have any handy. Um, so I'm gonna get as much of that out and then still move this outside because if this does fire up, it's gonna blow ungodly smoke everywhere, which is probably toxic. So <laughs> try and uh, get it out of this confined space. So anyway, put the recall unit on and we'll get going with that. So I've tipped the contents of this tank out. And then I'm just going to put a bit of metho in the tank. Give that a swish around. Then tip that out. And then we'll put some fresh fuel in it. Uh, also be aware you can have water in the whole line and the prime bowl. So what I'll do is once I've got fuel in there, I'll use a screwdriver or something to open the valve and then pump that through until, uh, until clean fuel comes right at the end. Clean fuel. For 10 litres, I'm going to put 200 mils of oil in. I do actually have a nice little measuring cup for this, but I can't find it. But this will do. The other thing I, sort of my new favourite uh, product now is this Worth Fuel Cure. Um, it's a bit like, uh, I guess, putting a bit of metho in, in some ways, um, but specifically designed for engines and fuel systems that have had water in it. Uh, it says this does up to 100 litres, so I'm only going to put about that much in. And the nice thing about that is it'll get into the crankcase and all those places that we uh, haven't got to if there happens to be some water issues. It's also a lubricant. So I'll give this a bit of a shake. And then I'll uh, just press this little ball valve in and squeeze the bulb until I've flushed fresh fuel through the fuel line and then we'll hook it up. And yeah, definitely still still water in that fuel line so don't go to all the effort of cleaning your tank and doing all that and have the very first thing you do is run water back through your carburetor. Yeah, 
yeah, you can still see that possibly in the bottom there's still that layer. I'll tip this out and do that again just to make sure we're clear. now. It's only a mistake you have to make once is uh, go into all the effort to take carb off, clean it and then put water straight back into it. The uh, earmuffs on for some cooling water. Then I get to start huffing and puffing. Let's see how long this takes. Ah, lanyard. Uh, I don't have a dead man switch in, I'll go find one. That's another mistake you only make once is pull starting for ages without the lanyard in. Alright, let's see how we go. Water on. Me luck. Give it a bit of choke. Of course, there's no fuel in it yet, so I'll just pump it through now, fill the carburetor bowl. I've been pulling on this for a little while without much luck now, so I'm just going to take these reed valves out. Something I probably should have done when I had the carburetor off the first time. And we'll see what we see. They actually look pretty tidy. They're completely closed. Sorry, I don't have my viewfinder. I'll probably flash it out. Uh, they actually look pretty tidy. Um, no corrosion and they're completely closed. So, I reckon that's pretty good. Alright, we'll whack this back together and just keep pulling, I guess. Before I keep pulling on this and end up in some big ball of caffeinated sweat, I'm going to uh, do a compression test on this just to see whether we've suffered any real damage from the seizing and unseizing process. Because if we haven't got any compression, it doesn't matter how long I pull on this thing, nothing's going to happen. That sounds so dodgy. So wide open throttle for the compression test, um, I'm going to use the adjustment screw just to lock it open. So all I'm doing here, uh, don't be lazy Stuart, I'll show you. So all I'm doing here is just undone this screw, get it to full throttle, then lock it off. That way we can do the compression test without needing more hands than I've got. And uh, always make sure your test is zeroed before you begin. Oh yeah, 125, I'm happy with that. Is it right? One thirty something. All right. So I'm pretty satisfied now. We've definitely got spark. I pulled a plug out and saw it. I think we'll just keep cranking this over for a bit. All right. When you've got compression and spark, fuel's the obvious sort of missing thing. So I opened the drain plug on the cupboard bowl, and nothing came out. 
So what I'm thinking is this seat may have risen up. Um, one of the dangers of using strong compressed air when you're sort of cleaning carburetors is that um, you can actually uh, dislodge parts and do a bit of damage. So what I'm going to do is take seams open, but I'm actually just going to blow through here with my mouth and just see whether this valve is actually opening when the fuel level drops. Because if that's stuck closed, no fuel will ever get into the carburetor. This is a little bit off topic for this video now, but uh, you know, it's the way it goes. Let's give this another go now before this uh, camera goes flat. Better? Sure, also remember to turn the tap on. Side. Well that wraps up this video. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, wasn't the video I was expecting to do so um, I'll retitle it. Um, but I hope it gives you an idea what to do if you get an outboard that's just completely seized, uh, how to go from unseizing it to starting it again. Um, obviously the finer points will change based on your situation. That last little bit of carburetor trouble I had um, is something that uh, you know you may not encounter. Uh, but you do have to sort of deal with each little situation as it arises. So step one, um, you know, get it unseized um, patiently. Breaker bars can put a lot of force on, on a motor. Um, so just be very gentle. It's very hard to describe, but it really is a feel thing. Just give it a bit of leverage, see if it's coming or not. If it's not coming at all, let it soak a bit longer. Um, unless it's just a complete rust bucket you know and it's uh, needs to be written off uh, it will eventually free up like this one did and run again you know um, this motor may well go for a long long time even though it was completely frozen solid uh, so um, after that obviously there's a reason it's it's seized it could just been sitting out in moist air um, this is obviously ingested a fair bit of water through the fuel system so it wasn't as bad as a sunk outboard but there still was water in the carburetor etc that need cleaning out uh, and obviously the whole fuel tank as well. So try and have a look at what caused the seizing if it's unexpected. Um, that's, uh, you know, just going to stop it becoming a whole new problem when you try and start it. Also, for those of you with a sharp eye, you may have noticed this Subaru's uh, spun round during the course of this video, and that's actually the first time we've managed to get this thing running. Uh, we inherited this after it um, sunk in a flood, so it would have been completely underwater. Well, not completely, but well past the ECU and everything, so a lot of electrics um, were soaked and corroded as well so it felt a bit like working on a boat but um, that's actually now running for the first time so that'll be disappearing at the workshop too. Um, we do cars, people want to bring cars in. Anyway, so uh, thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this video and it helped you if you have this problem, which I hope it did, uh, please uh, rate, comment, subscribe and I'll catch you soon. See ya.